thousand years old. Just as the Mona Lisa reflects the ideas, ideals of the Renaissance Italy, this Japanese sculpture group reflects the taste and beliefs of the world in which it was created. 11th century Japan was dominated by a ruling class that valued elegance and courtly manners above all. The Amida cult appealed particularly to the upper classes because its promised paradise resembled the continuation of the luxurious life of beauty and ease that they knew on earth. Yet even today, in a completely changed world, embracing different religious beliefs, brought up in a different culture, we can appreciate the skill and genius that makes Joko's sculptural grouping a great work of art. Please take the quiz associated with this lecture. Thank you. Welcome back. This is the second part of uh, chapter one. Warning, he will see some brief nudity. Chapter one, the power of art. Powers of art, bringing faith to life. Through art, the deepest and most intangible beliefs of a culture can be translated into powerful images that communicate specific spiritual messages to the people who view them as part of their religious rituals. From the beginning of humanity, people have expressed their beliefs in material form. They pictured their gods and goddesses in statues and paintings. They built palaces, places for worship and religious rites. The Amida Buddha is an excellent example of how art brings religious beliefs to life. In some periods, such as the Middle Ages in the Western world, most art was religious in character. So much visual art is related to human beliefs and rituals of worship that it would be easy to fit an entire library with books exploring the relationship between art and faith in different cultures. Prehistoric Art and Magical Powers Art need not be as beautiful as the Mona Lisa or as elegant and sophisticated as Japanese sculpture to be considered great art. Some of the most powerful art ever made was done more than 10,000 years ago by the prehistoric hunting tribes who inhabited Europe before and during the last ice age. One of the very earliest known artworks of this period is a tiny four and one eighth inch carved stone figurine known as the Venus of Willendorf. Because it is obviously female, Willendorf after the town in Austria where it was found. It is believed to be between 30,000 and 35,000 BC. Although the exact purpose and meaning remain shrouded in the mists of time, scholars have surmised that this female fertility figure was used as some kind of magical charm. With her exaggerated breasts, belly, and buttocks, the faceless Stone Age Venus provides a powerful visual image in the life-giving Earth Mother. Such fertility symbols were repeated in many different materials and locations throughout Europe and were probably connected with rituals that associated human fertility with the survival of the Ice Age clan or tribe. For Stone Age people who made and used them, these were not works of art in the same sense that we understand the term. These amulets were made to be touched, held, carried, stroked, and worshipped, not to be viewed as beautiful objects in a glass cabinet or admired as the works of individual artists. As old as the Venus is, we now know that art making is much older. In 2011, a 100,000-year-old art workshop was discovered in a South African cave. Inside were grinding tools, paint pots, and even traces of yellow reddish ochre and black charcoal pigments. Evidence revealed that the pigments were mixed with fat to make paint. Although no painting survived, handmade beads were also found. These art materials are at least 60,000 years older than the first known examples of cane paint, painting and sculpture. Also in 2011, prehistoric art by preschoolers, pre, preschool-aged artists, was discovered in a series of caves in France. Apparently, while sitting on the shoulders of their parents, young artists made thousands of decorative flutings or scraped finger tracings 
on the soft stone ceilings. By the size of the marks, we know some artists were as young as three years of, old, of age. The most flutings were done by a five-year-old, believed to be a girl. Wider marks revealed that the adults also joined in. Other creations of Ice Age tribes living in what is now France and also Spain include the earliest surviving paintings. Popularly known as cave paintings, these dramatic prehistoric pictures were done around 15,000 BC. When the decorated caves at Lascaux, France were discovered accidentally in 1940 by some boys looking for an underground entrance to an old chateau, they caused a sensation throughout the world of history, archeology, span and art. On these rocky walls, viewers could gaze back at the handiwork of people whose culture remained shrouded in mystery. So these young people discovered the Lascaux Caves and went and told the locals in the village about them. But there was some skepticism about whether or not the children actually did the cave paintings or whether they were very old. Um, a local university was contacted, but around the time that started happening, the Nazis invaded and took over France. So during this time, um, life was rather precious and they didn't really have time to explore the Lascaux cave paintings. So that didn't start to take place again until after World War II. Entering into the eerie dark caves, viewers find pictures of huge Ice Age beasts. Primary subject of these early cave paintings are animals, most often bulls, horses, and bison, sometimes mammoths and woolly rhinoceros. Humans were rarely shown. The depiction of these wild animals was not simplified or awkward. The cave paintings do not resemble the art of children. They are naturalistic. Because the animals were drawn in motion, as if they were alive. Even without photographic details, contemporary viewers have no problem telling that one form is a horse, another a bull. Were these images meant as records of successful hunts, or were they part of magical rituals meant to ensure success for future hunting parties? We cannot be absolutely sure of their purpose. The most common explanation for the cave paintings is that they were used by their creators in magical rites. It is certainly unlikely that these pictures were simply decoration for people's living quarters. Most are painted in dark, difficult to reach parts of the caves, portions that show no archeolog archeological evidence of having been lived in. We do not know that the artists came to these special caves to paint on scaffolds by the light of oil lamps. Remnants of the lamps and their pallets, along with holes for their scaffolds, have been found. After the paintings were completed, the caves and their images seem to have been used in ceremonies for thousands of years. Prehistoric rock art was not simply a European phenomenon. Paintings and carvings on rocks can be found in the Americas, Asia, and across Africa. These sites reveal that art played a vital role in the rituals of tribal peoples for tens of thousands of years. In northwestern Australia, Rock paintings in the Guian Guian art by the indigenous peoples, or as the Bradshaw paintings, after the man who first publicized them, show human silhouettes that seem to sway in a graceful dance. According to Aboriginal explanations, these elegant figures, pictured wearing elaborate headdresses and tassels, represent spirits associated with their creation story. The dating of these paintings remains controversial, with estimates ranging from 50,000 to 3,000 BC. New examples of Australian rock paintings are still being discovered, while the culture that produced these sophisticated images remains mysterious. Tribal art is the art of any area of the world where people lived or still live in a pre-industrial state, generally without permanent buildings, written language, or modern technology. Such art is what art historians once called primitive art, considered crude and uncivilized by Europeans and Americans. Around the year 1900, their attitudes changed. Tribal art was seen as new and exotic, valued by collectors and artists for its immediacy and impact. More recently, 
there has been an attempt to appreciate and understand the arts of tribal peoples living around the world as an expression of the cultures and beliefs that produced them. For instance, African masks have been popular with European and American art collectors for more than a century and had a dramatic impact on the development of modern art. In museums, these sculpture masks are displayed as isolated art objects. Masks exhibited in the static way retain their visual power. The power of the original meaning has been lost. Within the culture and religion for which they were created, masks conveyed a variety of complex messages that are unknown to most museum viewers and are often obscured even to the collectors who purchase them. Masks are meant to be worn in association with elaborate costumes during ceremonies where traditional songs and dances are performed. Within these ceremonies, which are scheduled according to the agricultural calendar and can last for several days, the masks have magical functions. For instance, some masks are supposed to transmit the spirits of the gods or ancestors they represent to the dancers, enabling them to dance for hours. The magical powers attributed to art by prehistoric peoples and primitive tribes are not generally accepted in our modern scientific and industrialized world. Still, even if we do not believe that works of art can cure sickness, placate dead spirits, assist us in predicting and controlling the future, or put us in direct touch with supernatural forces, we are not totally immune to the magical power of art. Imagine how you would feel if you discovered that someone had poked holes in a photograph of your grandmother's face. Would you calmly reflect it's only a damaged piece of paper? Or would you consider it an unjustifiable attack on a dearly loved person? Another sign that forces once called primitive are still alive today is the recent return of the prehistoric tribal art to high fashion. Tattoo, the marking of skin with designs, it's an art that has been practiced around the world for thousands of years. Its name originated in Polynesia and is from the Tahitian word tatau. A tattoo is made by inserting permanent pigment into the skin by a variety of means, most commonly needles. Although a tattoo can still be controversial in 21st century America, it is just the opposite for the Maori tribes of New Zealand. Its creation is a sacred act, and the tattoo artist is considered a holy person. The traditional method utilizes very sharp bone chisels to cut lines into the skin. Next, a chisel is dipped into natural pigments, such as charcoal or dry caterpillars, which are shaken into the wounds to add colors. Tattooing was coming of age right for the young men and women that demonstrated an adolescent strength and courage. It's a matter of pride to never make a sound as the cuts were made. Because the chisels left grooves, a long, painful healing process followed. While the recently tattooed young people rested and fasted afterwards, they were, they were soothed by the sweet flute music and rumbling, numbing leaves applied to their swollen skin. The most important Maori tattoo is the tamoka, or facial tattoo. Although it is a mix of many traditional patterns, the design of curves and spirals to each person's tamoko is unique. The markings are a coded map that can be understood by other Maori and explain the status and genealogy of its viewer. For example, the sides of the face reveal one's ancestry, a father on one side, a mother's on the other side. A person's rank can be read by reading the designs on the forehead. Only Maoris of the lowest status could not have a tamoko. One's tattoo is one's teanga, or treasure. It is also your identity. When the signature was required on important documents, tribal chiefs would draw a picture of their tamoko. Religious art gives visual expression to inner beliefs and has the ability to raise people's spirits above their problems of daily life. For centuries, humans have created special places to worship with art. Such temples or churches are designed to convey particularly religious messages and spiritual values. These places of devotion